silence. All right. Here we are. We're live, and I'm super excited. I'm Diane Gibbs. Um, this is Design Recharge, another great episode, and I am super excited because I have loved French paper since um, I started designing, which was like 20 years ago, and they've still remained my favorite. I always, if it's something for my company, I always spec French paper, and I, I love it. And when I can use it for clients, I love that as well. Uh, and we're going to talk to Brian French today, and he is um, the sixth generation, or the sixth generation of uh, French paper people. French paper people. Hey, that's something else. Little, but anyway. So I'm super excited to have you here, Brian. Thank you so much for being here, and I'm excited to have everybody in the chat. Yeah, it's uh, it's our pleasure to be here. Looking forward to it. Awesome. All right, so we're going to dig down and go ahead and get started. We have a bunch of questions, and again, if you're new. You can always type in your questions in the chat, and then you're going to see some stuff. Um, Brian's given me some images, and we're going to pull those up on screen. So, all right, so give us a little background about French paper and how it got started and when it started. Uh, so it actually goes back a long, long ways. Um, uh, Colonel J.W. French, which was generation number one, uh, was actually living in uh, Connecticut on the East Coast. Uh, and the guy that ran Michigan Wood Pulp Company hired him to come out to southwest Michigan to run the mill for him. Uh, he was a, a successful businessman and had a bunch of uh, separate companies around here in the area once he moved here. Uh, he ran Michigan Wood Pulp Company for a while, and uh, finally the owner said, you know what, I'm done with this. Would you like to buy it? And uh, he did in 1871 and took it over, and that's when it became French Paper Company, and we've been here ever since. That's awesome. So, and then it stayed within the family. And now, this is something I think that isn't as uh, maybe popular in today. A lot of uh, people who are starting out, um, they want to just go and build their own, make their own way, make their own path. And so, how did you? Do you feel like pressured into staying in the family business? Or you and Kim are both. Uh, it's your sister, so you're both kind of out there uh, doing this, so can you give us a little history, like you hate your job and blah, blah, blah. I know you don't, but, you know, <laughs> that's what some people might think. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, honestly, I think the most attractive part of it to me, and I would say I speak for my sister as well, is that we have a ton of fun. Uh, my dad and my grandpa, one of their favorite sayings is, you never work a day in your life if you enjoy it. Uh, right. and, and we really do. Every, every day here, there's something new. We get to do such cool projects, and, and we hang out with really awesome people. Uh, it, it's honestly, there's n never a dull day, that's for sure. There's always something crazy and exciting going on, and I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I never had any pressure from my parents. I give them a lot of credit with that because, I mean, obviously, uh, you hate to see five generations do it and then just have some idiot kid drop out, but... Uh, uh, my parents never said anything. They waited for me to ask. Uh, believe it or not, I was on the law school path. I was headed that direction, and uh, I, I finally said, you know what, let's give this a shot, and uh, I haven't looked back a day since. Uh, that was seven years ago I've been full-time, so uh, it, it's, it's a great time. It really is. Um. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Is it not cracking now? People are over there saying it's cracking. Is that better? Sounds pretty good to me. Okay, okay. Well, it sounds fine to me too, uh, but hopefully maybe it, somebody else will tell us over in the chat. I'm sorry if it was cracky sounding. I know it was hopefully. Anyway, you're getting tons of no more cracks. Yay, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so... You never felt pressured. You were going to law school. You changed. So, but Kim had a little bit different. And I, one of the things, it's all these men, right? And I'm going to pull up this image. Um, your six generations of French paper. Um, and then, so, so there's Kim. Kim's there. I know there's more. There's more than um, six, right? There's seven yep. people for six generations. So, talk a little bit about that. And um, I think, and Russ just cracked me up. He said crack kills, and it sure does. Um, so can you talk a little bit about Kim's role and how in the paper industry that's that's so different and so huge? Uh, yeah, so uh, my sister, she took a whole other route. So yeah, I, I started fresh after college. Uh, my sister took the, the, the long way around. She actually moved out to New York. 
she was in the fashion industry doing uh, big city stuff and and kind of the opposite of French paper, you know, large company, large city, uh, and, and that fun stuff. And she kind of just, uh, she did 10 years, was super successful, and kind of wanted a, a change up, a, a kind of a mix up in life. And she wanted the big city life, but she wanted a little more Midwest. So she came back to Chicago and became a, our sales rep there. So uh, I give her a lot of credit because it's been a huge, huge culture shock for her going from a, a large Fortune 500 company to little old French paper, uh, <laughs> especially being a family company and having to deal with me and my dad. But uh, uh, the the thing that's really most impressive to me about it is that it's a it's always been a very male dominated industry. I mean, you can see by our generations, but uh, it's been pretty much the same everywhere else. Um, and the print industry as well is very uh, male dominated. So Kim's doing a, a really hard thing to come in and really make her way and break in. And she's doing a heck of a job of it, which is pretty impressive. Go, Kim. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited that she's doing it. And I'm excited that the families um, embrace that instead of like, hey, no, you have to be a man to do this. I think that's, that's awesome. And that also speaks a lot to your family. But one thing you said during our test that really stood out to me was like, hey, you know, my grandpa still works here. And I thought that was amazing. Talk a little bit about that and, and that your dad works there too. Yep. So uh, right now, and this is actually the first time in the history of the company, we have three generations here all at the same time. Uh, in the past, it's always been one or two. And uh, we're pretty lucky right now. Grandpa's 91 years old, and he comes in six days a week. Uh, he gets here super, super early in the morning. Usually 4.30 is when he, he strolls in. Uh so yeah, he, he's here every day. Honestly, it gets me out of bed earlier because I get to come in and hang out with him before everybody shows up. It's kind of my little selfish time to hang out with Grandpa and, and chat and drink a little bit of coffee and, and kind of hang out. But uh, like I said, we're so lucky that we get to have our time with him. And I mean, it's it's really, really nice. We see him every single day, which is awesome. Right, so I think, I think that's awesome. I'm going to stay small because I think I'm... My crack is back if I'm big, which is weird, but we're going to just leave it. Hopefully they'll tell me in the chat. But Mike has a really good question. He says, question about mill promotions. Years ago it seemed like French output um, output more promotions on a regular basis maybe. Is there a reason for cutting back? Any chance of uh, ramping up promos with a paid subscription or something similar? Uh, you know, it's uh, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily create less promotions, Versus, it's a lot harder to get them out there. Um, I mean, we we still do eight to ten different promos every year. Uh, I mean, it was a lot more back in the day, and honestly, it was it was budget driven. Uh, you know, back especially late '80s, early '90s, things were really good in the paper industry, and people went bananas and produced a lot of promos. Uh, not only French paper, but all the paper mills. And I think nowadays, I mean, we we just don't we, we don't have the budget that we had back then for advertising. Um, we still produce quite a bit. I mean, like I said, we do eight to ten. Uh, we do we ramp up for the the show season and we we distribute at shows. The I think the the thing that makes it seem like we do less is that distribution forms a lot harder than it used to be. There aren't anywhere near as many paper shows as there were before. Uh, direct mail is a heck of a lot harder. Trying to get a, a good mailing list is way different than it was back in the day because not a lot of people really give their address up for a mailing list. Um, and uh, merchants, uh, you know, spec reps were a huge thing for us a long time ago, and there aren't anywhere near as many spec reps as there used to be. Uh, we used to have hundreds upon hundreds, and I think we're down to 35 in our distribution network. So it's a, wow. it's a lot of things added up that make it seem like that. But I promise we are printing stuff. We haven't given up on it. <laughs> right. So... So, um, so Mike wanted to know, you know, what about doing um, a paid thing? So, and, and right, you know, like I always get the pack. Like um, I have a whole pack back there. All of that colored paper is all French paper. The only hammer mills the white crappy copy paper, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to use my good paper. But, um, but you know, the, you sell packs, which I really like as a as a buyer. Is the crack still there? Just just so you know, anybody. Anyway, um, hopefully they'll answer that question. But the you can you could buy the packs. But I think maybe Mike's talking about having something like a, a 
monthly thing or which might be a little much but maybe or quarterly when you're talking about um, new promotions or something maybe thank you Abby I appreciate it uh, we've uh, we've talked about doing that in the past the the hard part for us is I think people don't realize how expensive promotions really are um, so if we open that up we have we have to wind up making a ton more and I mean those things are a lot more expensive than you'd think and I think a lot of people would say they'd love to have them and it'd be really hard to to choke it down when you realized how much it was um, it's kind of something we we've also talked about doing uh, smaller versions of things, you know, more simplified versions, uh, and and then offering it like that. What we do try to do is on our website when people order retail, we'll try to throw things in every quarter. Uh, we we try to put together a pack of of promos and throw throw them in there with orders. So we we do try to distribute them that way. So Mike says, you know, he'd just appreciate a way to get his hands on the promos. Um, without attending the, the design conferences. So maybe there's something that you're already doing, maybe not n new promos, but just be able to get, so even paid, I think, is what he was saying. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's our, the mic that, um, where Mike Jones, Mike Jones, but Mike Jones had a question. And so I want to read his question. I always like to get my questions from the audience first. So how do you go about naming your papers? And what would it take to get a paper named after Creative South? Or someone submitted a paper name, and then he winked. Um, well, only for Mike we can do that. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, the, the naming thing is actually, it's kind of crazy. I. Uh, uh, it depends on the paper line, obviously. Um, sometimes they just name themselves, and it's really easy. But other times, it's it's a big process. Uh, Pop tone, for instance. Uh, I wasn't here for then, but I've heard the stories. We actually had everybody go to candy websites, pull up all the candy names they could come up with, and we literally just made a huge list, and then broke it down and decided what made the most sense and what worked. Um, Plum Punch, I think we had 15 different names for it before we finally broke down and said, okay, we have to label these boxes. Let's decide and make a decision. Uh, the Craft Tone ones, it was actually all CSA. They, they had them named before they even knew what color they were going to be. They were really far ahead on that one. That one was the easiest one. That's cool. Yeah. And so that, let's talk about that a little bit. You guys have launched a new line, so you must have seen a... Um, I can't even remember what the name of the paper is that I use. Oatmeal, I think, is the one that's like I used it, and it like sells like quick. Um, it's a really fast seller, and they were like, "You can use Craft. We could put." And I'm like, "Okay," but I'd really <laughs> like oatmeal. So, talk a little bit about um, if you can. You develop this new line. You see when do you develop a new line? When do you see a need, and and how do you decide? Because really, that Craft Tone line really flushes out a lot of colors that weren't there. And again, this is the power of French paper because you guys are small, you can do these things, and this is why, to me, you've stayed on the top, um, and you've always been that, that industry leader. Yeah, um, I mean, m honestly, when we do a grade, it's it's market-driven. Uh, whether it's designers, printers, or our large end users, it comes down to things that we're seeing a lot of, hearing a lot of, or something that we're making custom on our machine over and over for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. uh, we just kind of try to pay attention to what the trends are going on. And uh, uh, especially like Craft Tone, we've, we, Speckle Tone is very popular, especially Speckle Tone Craft. It's one of our most popular items. We create a lot of custom crafts. So it truly made sense to have more options in there. People people do a lot of custom colored craft sheets with us. Mm -hmm. We said, you know, hey, if, if these people are doing that, then everybody else is probably going to want some of that too. Um, so we create we create a, a big list of sheets. We have a pile of, of colors. And then the CSA guys really break it down for us. They create a color palette out of it. Um, we're terrible at that stuff, so thank God we have them. They handle it for us and make sure that we're not doing something really dumb. Um, and then we'll actually we'll look at our own grades and uh, our competitors' grades and say, you know, it, it, what's missing here? Uh, in, in the craft tones case, we didn't have any mid-tone grays. You know, we had a lot of really light grays, a lot of really deep grays, and we just didn't have anything in the middle. So that's where those two grays actually came from. Yeah, and those there really isn't in other. Um, my husband, his business card used to be a gray, and it was really difficult to find a paper that was 
light enough to be able to print black or a dark color or or otherwise you'd have to like print silver or white and so there really wasn't something so it really solved a huge problem um, so Abby has the same question as me and it wasn't on the sheet so it says Abby wants to know and I think this is a great question Abby what's the process for getting a custom paper made how much does it how much has to be ordered and how much does it cost now granted cost is probably going to differentiate right between different things but give us kind of a breakdown yeah um I mean, this is honestly, this is the, the fun part with French paper. Us being small, we have some of the smallest minimums out there. Uh, we're pretty light on our feet because we're small too, so we can do it pretty quickly, and uh, um, we do a ton of it. Uh, I'll put it this way. We have over 3,200 custom colors in our computer system, and that includes 55 different shades of black. So we do tons and tons of custom colors. Um, so essentially what it is, it's uh, one beater is what we need to make a custom color, which is 10,000 pounds. It usually comes out to about five pallets worth of paper. It sounds like a lot. Um, obviously, you're not going to be doing it for a business card or something like that. But if you have a project, there, there's a pretty good chance if you're a decent-sized company that it, it is going to be doable, especially if it's something that you're going to use repeatedly over and over again. Um, right. And uh, so that's, I mean, we can do a custom color. We can split that in between two basis weights, which is pretty nice. So you can do a, a lightweight and a heavyweight and use them for two different projects. That way you can split it up and it makes it a little more palpable. That's uh, cool. Cost-wise, most of the time we see our custom runs end up actually cheaper than a standard sheet a, on a per-pound basis. Uh just simply because we're we're making a huge run for you, we it's a little better for French paper, and we pass that along. So uh, unless it's something super super deep or super dye oriented, they actually tend to be a little cheaper than just buying regular paper over and over and over again for the same quantity. That's cool to know, and it's good. It makes us as the designers see, think that the you have the capacity and the capability. Sometimes we think that those custom things are just really out of our our clients budget so this is a really important question Jason Craig who I love um, wants to ask what is your favorite kind of toast my favorite kind of toast is uh, wheat not not super toasted just kind of lightly toasted and definitely peanut butter oh so no butter but peanut butter so if you are going to toast regular butter do you put the butter on the bread before or the butter on the bread after it's toasted I don't put any butter on at all. Is that weird? Ever? Ever? No. Like never? Have you? No. Am I strange for that? No. I, that, I, <laughs> that's a little, but that's okay. So one question I asked you um, was how many people work at French Paper? And you go ahead and give me your grandpa's answer because I really like that one. And then you can tell me. Grandpa's standard answer is about half. If you, if you ask him <laughs> how many people work here, he says about half. Uh, the the true answer is a little over a hundred, uh, uh, typically overall in the company. So, right around a hundred, a little over. So, um, Mike had a question. Well, oh, so this is awesome. I when I talked to Brian again, that's why I love French paper. So, Mike wants to know: Does French ever offer mill tours? Tell them what you told me last Friday. Like you had a mill tour that day. I had a mill tour about an hour after I talked to you last Friday. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean we definitely do them. Uh, we we do a lot of them tend to be around a custom order. So if somebody's doing a custom, we'll have them in. We'll show them through the mill, and then they'll actually watch their paper being made on the machine. And that the the nice part for us is we know it's exactly what they want it to be. Uh, you know, we can match a PMS perfectly, but sometimes a PMS in your head and a PMS on a paper machine are two different things. So we can guarantee that it's exactly what you want. Um, we we, uh, we give tours. Sometimes we'll do them for schools, uh, for the universities, uh, design classes. That way people can understand what they're going into when they hit the paper portion. Uh, but, yeah, we definitely do them. And, it, again, it, um, you have about half the people working there, right? No, I'm just yep. kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm included in the non-working half, if you ask Grandpa. So, <laughs> right, he probably just thinks you're doing some fluff today, right? So I just appreciate that you're spending time with us working, right? Yeah. Um. All right. So, uh, um, Levi wants to know. Tron um, wants to know is um, he wanted he had to ask this question before, but wanted to check um on the possibilities of getting. So this is uh, Tron and uh. Uh, Levi and Kendrick did this, that uh, screen print, um, and I believe it's on a speckle tone. Wants to 
um, check on the possibility of getting instead of 18 by 24, which I believe that print is, to getting a 19 by 25. I guess so that he can print bleeds. I'm assuming, maybe. Uh, so we we sell a 2519 on the website. I assume you mean you mean a little bigger than that. I don't know what he means. I oh. um. Hmm. So, so you uh, sell 19 by 25 already on the website? Yeah, we sell 2519. I assume he means a little bigger so that he can have bleed on that size. Oh, um, so. so we we do all of our sizes that we offer. Um, mo we we develop those all based on. It, it all comes off our paper machine size. So our paper machine creates two 53 inch rolls or a 106 inch roll. We split it into two 53s. From there, we split it down to sheets, and everything comes out based on that. So all those sizes are essentially the biggest we can give you without wasting a bunch of space. Right. Um, we're trying to throw away the least amount possible. Right. However, okay. that being said, we are looking at adding a couple different sheet sizes to the website in the very near future. Okay, cool. Well, I don't know if that answered... Um, uh, Levi's question, but we'll hopefully we'll keep going. I think Levi knows where to get a hold of me, so we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get a little bit. So you guys actually do a lot of recycled paper. That's uh, been um, you've always done that even before it was cool. But one other thing you've done that was cool, and I forget to put myself up there, big. Sorry about that. Um, is 1922 French paper switch from electric to um, hydro power. Can you talk a little bit about that and why that's really cool now, but necessarily back then? Can you fill us in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, our, our hydropower was completely a business decision. Uh, it's awesome for French paper now because it is very green and it's it's awesome. It's, it's super cheap versus buying electricity. Uh, but what happened was uh, in, in the 1920s, 19-teens, uh, the city of Niles had really up and down electricity. It came and went. And uh, being super inconsistent, it shut the machine down every time it went down. So we couldn't make paper when we didn't have power. And uh, essentially, my grandpa, great-grandpa, got frustrated with it. This is Frank here, by the way. Uh, he got really frustrated and decided, you know, we're going to figure out a way to make this on our own so that we don't have to rely on, on the power. So we, he bought the rights to the river, uh, built a dam, and put in hydropower. And we've been running off it ever since. So over 90 years, we've been making our own power and, and running off it here. The the really fun part about it is when we're not, we're not making paper, we actually sell the power back to the power grid. So the houses around us are actually running off our power. That's cool. But it's also, um, it's not necessarily, maybe in the 20s it was cheaper. But you have, there's a lot of upkeep because now you have to um, make sure that the, the dam or work, the gears or whatever goes into power. Yeah, there there is a ton of maintenance. I don't don't think it's free. That's for sure. It's it's uh, we have to maintain the dam itself, the whole area of the river around it, and four hydroelectric generators create a lot of broken parts too. So our maintenance team spends a ton of time on that on that, just making sure that it's up running and doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So one of the other things, and then we'll get into what the secret of of your secret sauce is, I guess, um, is, and I just read Tiff Smith's uh, question, so it throws me off because I have ADD and I can't do two things <laughs> at once. Um, oh, anyway, I don't remember what it was. I'll get back to it. Um, so I've loved your stuff since um, the early 90s, I guess, when I started designing, when I was in school. And there's, the, I think, part, and you talked about this at Creative South um, at the Print, Ma Print Matters panel with um, Bob and Nick, but that was one thing to me that really stood out uh, was what your answer was, and just that um, your relationship with um, Charles Spencer Anderson. Can you talk a little bit about that and how they've really been a big proponent of just getting French paper out there? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the the honest answer is without CSA design, French paper would not be here today. Uh, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you folks, and, and we wouldn't be doing anything like this. I mean, I'd be doing something really boring somewhere in an office building stuck in a cubicle uh, pushing papers. Uh, so uh, Charles Anderson, uh, 
uh, Bruce Bigford and my dad met Charles when he was a young gun at Duffy Design Group. And uh, Chuck kind of took over uh, the the branding of French paper. He's very convincing, and he talked them into letting him kind of have his way. Uh, and that's the best part about Chuck is that he convinced us that he knows better than we do, and it's the truth. <laughs> um, and that's I think that's the best part about French paper's design, I guess, is that it's designed by designers for designers. Um, creatives are our market without... Uh, designers choosing French paper, uh, we we have no way to sell paper. You know, the the designers are the ones making the decision and creating this. And Chuck speaks to that. Uh, the the cool part about us is that we're small enough and just just stupid enough that we know we don't know. Um, I mean, that's uh, my dad's famous saying when we do new promos is, "I don't like it, I don't get it, but okay," because we we don't know. Um, and the nice part is we let the designers just kind of have free reign. They go crazy with it, and that's how we get the cool stuff, um, and that's that's how we stick out. Uh, the, the wild part, honestly, about all our uh, design is a lot of people know us based on the design from CSA, but what they don't know is that Chuck has about a tenth of the budget to work with that all the other guys have, so for him to be able to make us so identifiable with no money compared to everybody else is is pretty fantastic. Well, and I think that that's a, one of the ways that, and you and I talked about this last week, was that because they are budget, um, it's a two-color job, and it just shows the power of what you can do with the color of the paper and then the color of a couple inks or one ink. And it really allows, it. that's one reason I think it, it works. You We can buy it small, you can buy small amounts and you can do small runs. We can, you know, because you you will sell to a consumer and I think it just, it really has that kind of like, hey, you're just part of the family, kind of let's, let's get this, let's get this thing going. But because he's had a limited budget, it makes it so much more powerful for us who are also on limited budgets. I yeah, think. yeah, I mean, I think it really fits. You know, he's, uh, Chuck always pushes let the paper be a part of the design rather than just being a place to cover a bunch of inks on. Uh, right. You know, and that's, he, he always pushes that limited inks, uh, you know, one color, two color, maybe sometimes three color. Uh, he, he loves doing it that way because, uh, like you said, you know, it, we have the same budget as everybody else. We're on the low end, and... Uh, the the nice part for me as a salesman is I'm not coming into a design group with a 19 color, right. you know, all sorts of fancy bells and whistles and saying, hey, look how cool this could be. Um, you know, we, we don't see the point in covering the paper because then it's it's not selling the paper. Right, right. And it's the power. That's the power of that paper. And, um, you know, you have different thicknesses, uh, the Duratone or... Con I think it's Duratone. That has a thinner weight, but it has such a nice, like, there's shiny areas on that paper. I love that paper. Um, I, I'm a big Speckletone fan, personally, and then I got in. So somebody asked, Tiff, let me get, get back to Tiffany's question. Tiffany asked, is it possible to get a variety pack? And I know you do have small 8.5 by 11 variety packs that actually show every color um, in, in all the weights, which I, I, Tiffany, if you don't know this, like, it's not really for printing, but it's really for feeling, and it's something you could do to do comps on or something for a client, which I really like, and I try to get those every time you, you push those out. Um, oops, I can't read it if people keep typing. Um, sorry, but keep typing. Um, instead of 100 sheets of one color, so, like, do 10 different colors of 100 sheets, is that something, this is a random customer service question, but I think that's a good question. Uh, the, the hard part for us is that we, we do a ton of orders every day, and it's just it's it's really hard to pull all those individual sheets. We we would love to do that, and we did do that uh, when we first started when the orders there weren't a ton of them. It's just we're at the point now where we really can't service that much hands on. Um, truly, the 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 web orders. I mean, the twenty five packs and the fifty packs are an insanely small quantity if you consider the the right. size of what we're doing here. So uh, it, it, as we keep going, we're trying to develop more ways to offer that, like the sample packs and things like that, just to be able to get give people a little more option there. Um, we are working on, that's another one we're thinking about with the new sizes, 
is some new sizes of the sample packs so that it's a little more, uh, you know, larger for somebody that wants to use a multi. But, I mean, truly, so anything going down to 25 and, and 50 sheets is pretty darn low for us, um, right. just, but just from a time aspect. Uh, our warehouse can do up to 250 orders in a day, and it's total chaos over there. <laughs> so one thing that impressed me, and this is what I lost, when I read a question, but I remember it and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. <laughs> so um, I think you talked about when you were in college, and this is, again, this is uh, my love for your company because um, you would come in on the weekends or maybe now, I can't remember when it runs together, sorry, but that it's like you're doing whatever they need you to do. Um, so, you know, like um, you would come in on the weekends and you would help pack shipments. And I think you were talking about this um, when Mama Saw started. You kept seeing there and you said you had their um, address memorized, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, during college when I was home on weekends, I would work the warehouse a uh, couple reasons. First off, it gave me spending money, which was nice. Uh, second off, it, it uh, I could help get the website caught up from the weekend. To, weekends we get a lot of orders and Monday gets crazy. So anything we can do to minimize that. Um, and like you said, I saw you know the first couple of Mama Sauce orders came in, and it, it's it's a goofy name, so you ca it's kind of stuck in my head. And then uh, I memorized Nick's name, and I memorized Joey's name, and then eventually I had the the address memorized. And you know then it became it was every weekend we had a Mama Sauce order, and uh, it, it kept going and going. And uh, like I told you the other day, uh, my dad and I were in Florida for an event when I first came on full time. And uh, I said, you know what? We're down here. Let's get a rental car and find these Mama Sauce guys and say hi to them. So we grabbed a rental car at the airport and went over to Mama Sauce and got to meet the whole team, which was awesome. Um, and we've been buddies ever since. Uh, uh, we see those guys whenever we have the opportunity, and uh, some of their employees from them have spread out, and we get to see them all over the country now. So uh, they're a great group, and we have a lot of fun with them. <laughs> And so you guys really kind of partnered up, and you did something called Print Matters. Can you just talk about, I know we're totally skipping around, but talk a little bit about why that got started and, and what you thought was missing from the industry of design and that nobody was really talking about paper and printing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Nick and I, we, so we met in person, and then we, we talked on social media a lot. We were always interacting on there. Um, we started texting back and forth, and we started seeing each other at events. And we, you know, over drinks or dinner or whatever it was, we said, you know, all these design events are so cool. It's all these amazing designers, super talented people talking about, you know, what, they're di what they do, what their process is. We said, you know, it, it always just ends at the design, though. There's never anything past that. And we said, why don't we talk about, why don't we start a thing? We talk about the design going into the paper selection and then all the way into the printing and really bring it all full circle. And you talk about how everything interacts, where it all comes from, and, and why it all makes sense and why it still matters. And that's where Print Matters started. So uh, we, we travel around. We try to do one stop a month, and, and we go somewhere and we talk to people about you know why print matters, why uh, an old French paper is still around, and why a, a young mama sauce can, can get started and get so much uh, attention. So uh, it's been a really fun thing for us to do. We, we meet so many cool people, and that's the best part about it. So you've had the, you have a great relationship with CSA. You also have a, a great new kind of relationship with mama sauce and Nick Sembrato. Um, do you have any, like, one thing I noticed um, when I was just looking through my old, because I don't throw them away. Like, I throw away the other people's paper, but y'all's paper samples <laughs> because they're like g little gems. And, um, like, I, I anyway, uh, geeking out, like, the Seinfeld poster thing. Like, I think that's, like, 300 bucks or something now. And I'm like, I have two copies. Yay! Oh, you know, yeah. I'm They, they pop off on eBay, too. That's the crazy part. Some of that old stuff, if you, if you Google, or if you eBay search French paper, People sell our stuff all the time on there. That's so wild. But that's about that's part of that cool thing. It's that that cool factor. But it's also that Charles Spencer Anderson has always been at that top. They're pushing the boundaries, or and you know you can even get some of those with the patterns that are co coming out. You guys um, always you had he used patterns on your swatch books way before other people did. And again it was that one or two color which I thought was always really powerful. Um, and his imagery, I think you can go and get a few free images on the site. Like the, he's always just 
it seems like a huge supporter. But you have this great relationship with him and his company, Uncle Chuck, and then you have, um, you know, Cousin Nick, I guess, right? Yeah. So <laughs> do you have any other um, relationships that have been really long term? And I know you had some with Williamson Printing, and but then has have you had other printers? Do you use printers that are local, or what do you? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and when it comes to printing, especially our stuff, we bounce around a lot. I mean, we have a ton of awesome relationships, uh, whether it's people that have been our customers forever and we've always just, we've talked to them, we've done buy-ins or whatever it was. Um, and then all the way down to, obviously, we, we buy a ton of print, too. Uh, a lot of times the decision gets made depending on what it is we're printing. I mean, obviously, not everybody is a master of every single type of thing. And Chuck, right. he really tries to mix up our our type of printing. I mean, we do a lot of offset just for, for cost reasons, but, you know, we do digital, we do some letterpress, we do a little bit of silk screen, so we, we do work around as much as we can, and it, we, we do a lot of stuff local to French paper, uh, one of the reasons being because it's a heck of a lot easier to ship paper local and then ship it back to us than it is to send it to California and back. Um, we also do a lot of stuff up in Minneapolis so that the CSA guys can have their hands on it. Uh, you know, they're the only ones that know how everything's supposed to look, so being having them be able to put their hands on it on press is uh, almost invaluable. Um, but then we also, I mean, we do some stuff here and there and, and uh, everywhere, true too. Uh, you know, like you said, we used to do everything with Williamson, um, and we've bounced around since then, too. Uh, we try to mix it up as much as we can. Well, and I think it's also, you know, it says a lot about your company that you have been able, and it says a lot about CSA, that you've been able to stay with trends and stay, because it, as some companies wane, you know, somebody gets tired, just like how you guys got the paper company, in, you know, in 1871, right? Um, somebody was like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I think a lot of times printers can be that way too. A lot of times printer... Um, Printers are family-run businesses, and they're generational, and then somebody doesn't want to do that business anymore. And then it could be quality wanes. It could just be that it's um, time to change, and you're doing something to try out somebody else or somebody else's you know, new thing. I think, I think that there's, it's great that you have relationships and you've built relationships, but there's always other things that come into that. But one thing... For me, using French paper, I've never seen quality. I've never seen, I mean, I've, ne I've always seen quality. I've never seen quality go down. Um, and I've always just been able to, um, like, there's been a couple papers. I was like, oh, no, you got rid of blank, <laughs> right? But now um, I know that it's a small enough run. If I wanted to have that color, I could get it back without that much trouble, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, obviously, we we try not to discontinue anything. It's a uh, if we made it, there's a reason we made it, and that's kind of the way we approach it. So there are some things, obviously, that are total duds, and and we you can't ignore that. Uh, the one that always comes up is frost tone. Uh, everybody always says, "Oh, we loved frost tone," but the the problem with frost tone was we sold a ton in uh, December. And then the rest of the year, it kind of sat around. It was it was great for Christmas cards, and then it didn't do a whole lot elsewhere. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's some things that we just can't turn a blind eye to, but it's it's darn expensive to get rid of a color, so we try not to do it unless we have to. All right, so Mike has another question. Man, Mike is full of questions today. I love it. Um, does French have plans to grow? And I don't know what he means by grow, but I guess size or location. I don't know. Um, um, you tell us, and then we'll go back. He has like six questions in one. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, if if I'm thinking of growth in the way I am, uh, we're not. I mean, we're not. We're not the paper mill that's going to go out and buy another paper mill and and take it over. Uh, that's not our our way of life. We love our size. We enjoy it. Um, my dad, he doesn't want to sit around pushing financials around. He wants to be on the phone talking to people. That's that's the way we enjoy it. We don't want to be a huge conglomerate. We we love being out here, walking through the mill, knowing everybody that works here. Um, that's that's more fun for us than you know trying to make have 15 paper machines and all over the country. And it's just it's it's not as fun as the way we do it. We we enjoy our size. We we don't have much interest in that. So he says, do you resist the idea of consolidation in the paper industry? Do you feel like there's pressure 
Do they feel that pressure? Do you feel that pressure? Uh, I mean, there is pressure to consolidate. There's uh, typically it's people pressuring us to sell versus us to buy. Uh, we we don't have a lot of people trying to sell us anything, but they they ask to purchase French paper. Um, which once again, that's to to me, it's not an option because I don't think anybody else is dumb enough to hire me. Luckily, I got my dad to do it. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I I'm not a huge fan of the the consolidation just because I see so many things go away that I think needs to be there. Uh, every time a swatch book goes away, it's something that a designer can't use. And uh, uh, trust me, I'm I'm the first one to say I understand not everybody uses French paper every time, but I, I want people to have options, and I hate seeing that weighing down so much. Um, and the other side of that is, if you see a swatch book go away, that typically means a paper mill closed, and that's a lot of people who are no longer making paper, and that hurts too. Right. So, um, this is a not one of Mike's questions. I don't think maybe <laughs> I finished. Um, and he says, I think that's what's special in your your niche, your focus in the paper market. And I also love that you are thinking about the people who work there. And all right, Abby has a question, and then I'll get to my mod tone question or mod paper or whatever. Anyway, what kind of experimentation? Oh, I really like this. Um, have you done with different fibers or paper making? Do you have an experimental department for members of your team to play with different techniques and such? Uh, as far as paper making goes, we're, I mean, we're pretty set because our paper machine can only do so much. Um, so, I mean, uh, as far as fibers go, we stick pretty tightly, not only by what our paper machine can handle based on refining, but also what we can get our hands on. Uh, we can come up with a lot of crazy ideas. The hard part is getting enough to make runs. Um, we've done some stuff with bamboo, and we've done some stuff with hemp and things like that, just trying it. Um, none of it really panned out to what we hoped it would be, but uh, honestly, one of the issues was, like I said, just getting enough fiber. Uh, we bring in truckloads upon truckloads, and a lot of those things are made for small, handmade stuff versus uh, actual industrial paper machines. Uh, uh, as far as experimentation goes, we do a ton of that. Most of it is customers' ideas. Uh, we've made paper with glitter in it. We've made paper with coffee grounds. We've made paper with grass. Uh, we've made paper with uh, carpet fiber. So we've done a lot of those things, and we do. Uh, luckily, once again, being small, we can say, "Yeah, let's try it." Instead of saying, "Oh, no way! Why would we ever do that?" So, right. Uh, I, I think that creative attitude goes all the way through the mill, uh, and truly, the guys out in the mill love that too. You know, if if you're out there making paper all day, you'd much rather be doing crazy stuff than, well, another day of white paper, another day of white paper. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Well, um, so. Um, earlier, and I don't remember who it was, but I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. So, will you? So, you go to conferences and you have tables. You do. You talk to people. Um, will French paper be at any conferences in the Midwest specifically? That's what I was asked. Uh, we hit as many of them as we can. So, obviously, the How is the big one we do uh, almost every year. We try to be at that one because it's it's such a great place to hit as many people as possible. Uh, that one was in Chicago last year, so we got to see everybody in Chicago. Um, the other ones we do are our merchant paper shows. So, we are at those, and that's actually starting last week and moving into the next couple months is when those are all going to be. So, we'll be at almost every single one of those. Uh, my sister's in Des Moines, Iowa right now at one right today. I was just talking to her before we started this. So, I mean, yeah, we definitely will. We we hit as many as we can. I think I have Grand Rapids, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and uh, Indianapolis just happened. So, it's yeah, there, there are a ton, and we hit as many as we can. All right, so I have a question specifically, and I didn't tell you about this earlier, but hopefully it's nothing like, oh, no, Diane, I'm not. I don't feel comfortable <laughs> answering that question. Um, but um, about mod tone, so it's one I always like really liked looking at, but I don't um, haven't bought it. I haven't used it. I could, I could see how it could be used, but it's different because it is a pattern, correct? It is, it is. Um, and that's, I think the, that is the, the crazy thing about that sheet is that it's so cool and everybody gets it, but uh, a lot of people have a hard time selling it to their customer because it's really hard to, to say, let's buy this printed paper and then print more on top of it. 
Um, the the fun part about mod tone is if you put a single hit offset on it, typically you're going to be able to see that pattern come through a little bit. If you do a double hit, it'll typically hide it. So you can actually control how much you see and how much you don't. And I've seen some amazing stuff come out of that with people that have taken the time to plan out exactly where they want texture, where they don't, and things like that. Well, I think it's a really powerful, and it um, would make really good for packaging. I don't know how people are using this, but that it's like it's already printed. Like, go amazing on this. That would be great yeah. for, like, a small mom and pop. It, you're a bakery, and now you're going to put all – I mean, that would be, like, amazing for something – yeah, you can go really crazy with it, and the, especially like something on packaging or even our envelopes. The 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 smart thing that CSA did when they came up with the idea that was a, a total CSA uh, brainchild on that one. They actually it's printed both sides at the same time, so that pattern is actually perfectly registered. So if you cut it, it's in the same spot. If you hold it up to light, it's the same exact spot. So you never have to worry about it being off register and, and crazy. So. Uh, it's a, like I said, I've seen some projects that just are mind blowing because you say, well, I never would have thought of that. Right. Well, and that's such a difference. Again, that's what sets y'all apart. That you're doing something that normal, a normal paper company wouldn't even attempt to do. But I do think that has to do with their, your relationship with CSA and them being oh, able yeah. to say, hey, push this or try this, and then you guys being flexible and nimble enough to be able to try something. I think that's been. It, for me, I love that you're pushing that element in the industry in that way. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, it, it's, it says a lot about CSA, too. I mean, the, the reason we can do those things is because we know more often than not, Chuck is right. Uh, the, the, his, him and his guys, they are very, very smart, and if, they, if they're convinced on something and they really push it with us, they're, they're probably going to be on to something. So another thing I love, and uh, Jason Craig does have another question, and it's football-related, unrelated to our topic here, but I like everybody to feel loved, especially <laughs> Jason. Brian, will Michigan State beat Iowa, Ohio State? Oh, I, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we have the defense to do it. If anybody can, I think it's us. Okay. Well, <laughs> back to regular... They're printing and paper and design, but I'm always happy. I'm not sure why Jason Craig said which one, but um, anyway, we're going to keep going. So um, another thing that I love, um, and I guess I, I'm just an advocate. Like I think that if you can have these super fans, um, it it sells your stuff, and I think that that's how a, a small company keeps um, keeps getting their name out there. Um, for anyway. That's what I think. So one thing I love is that I can have tiny clients, and they say, "Hey, I don't have a lot of money, um, but I want something that's going to stand out." Again, this is you offer me something to, as a consumer. So I've had to buy big, huge Nina paper sheets, and they don't um, maybe sell reams, so a specific paper. I have to buy a huge sheet for three dollars or ten dollars a sheet or something. It comes. It's not my client can't do anything with this they have to get it cut down so you're offering me different sizes you're offering me something that I could take and because the paper I have some ideas because you've already given me great paper samples but then you also I, I can get different colors I can always get envelopes that match I can do all these things for this tiny little client and it makes them look more professional more um, an expert in their field is that something that you've always wanted to do, or is that was that a CSA thing? Is that tell us a little bit about that? Uh, the the idea behind all the small quantity and thing like that it's it's all availability. Uh, like I said, we're we're a very small company. Just to give you guys an idea, we have ten people in our office. We are a very very small company. I know sometimes it can be deceiving and and things like that, but we we are super tiny. Um, and uh, you know, the, people can't use paper they can't get their hands on. And so the, the idea behind everything was just we, we need to get it in people's hands. We need to give everybody options. Uh, it's, it, it's, <laughs> you're going to pick what you're going to pick, but we, you need to have something to pick from. So all right. uh, it, it's all about options. Uh, when the Internet came around, Charles's idea was we got to be the first ones to do this. Everybody's going to do it. you got to be the first ones to hit it. And uh, my father, very, very intelligent businessman, but on this one he did not get it right. He says, uh, the uh, the Internet's a fad. It's not going to be around. Uh, 
And he said, I'm not going to hire somebody to run this website so that I can turn around and fire him in a couple of years when the internet goes away. So he made my mom run the website warehouse and do the fulfillment. <laughs> uh, 16 years later, my poor mother is still packaging orders in a warehouse uh, right now as we speak. Oh, well, I sure am glad for your mom. Um, <laughs> I guess you didn't want to let her go. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, as, in terms of that, the, I mean, the website—that's that's what—that's the idea behind it all. That's where it all came up. French paper. Uh, uh, as a small company, there aren't a lot of people out there saying, "Hey, let's stock French paper on our floor to resell." Uh, you know, we're we're just not a big enough player for people to to really push that. So we had to make it an option, and that was honestly the best way to do it was the, the internet. I mean, the, thank thank God for the internet. Without that, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Do you think? Your dad still thinks the internet's a fad. Uh, based on his capability with it, he might. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this email thing. It's not going to catch on. It's not going to catch on. Um, all right. So a uh, couple last questions. Um, um, okay. Let's see. Oh, another relationship that you guys have, um, or they've kind of reached out to you guys. So there are many designers and companies who, like myself, are super fans of French paper. House Industries, for example, has been using and singing your praises for years. How did this relationship begin, and do you seek out those relationships? Uh, House Industries is a cool story. Uh, so when they first started, they, they created this company, they started doing what they were doing, and they said, we're going to take a road trip from uh, Delaware to Minneapolis to see Charles Anderson. Uh, along the way, they found out that French paper was in between those two places. They weren't sure how far out of the way, they weren't sure where it was, but they found French paper in Niles. They showed up at like 6 o'clock on a Friday, and my dad was here. They stopped in, they did a tour, uh, and they wound up just sitting around and talking paper and talking about Charles and, and everything. And they wound up staying the night in Niles because they hung around so much longer than they thought they would. Uh, they continued their trip on up, saw, saw CSA, and, and toured his place too. Uh, and just from then on, they've been an incredible, incredible group. I mean, uh, they, they support us no matter what, through and through. Uh, and they, once again, they do so much cool stuff. I mean, they, they make us look good every single time. I, uh, I think, that, I think oh, that's really... No, I think that's really cool that, again... You didn't seek that out. They came to you, and but I also think that it's really nice that your dad spent time with with kids who were in college. You know that he didn't just dismiss them because they were young kids. Like, and I think that's again another one of y'all's superpowers. Yeah, I uh, the the best way we've ever been able to describe it is we are paper nerds. Uh, anybody that wants to talk paper, we will talk your ear off. No matter how long you're willing to listen, we'll probably go way beyond that. But we we talk paper all day long, and we love that. Um, so, I mean, truly, we whether it's at a trade show uh, and or whether it's on the street, no matter who it is, we'll talk paper with you. If you want to talk paper, design, printing, we, we absolutely love it. And uh, I think that's where a lot of that comes from. Not a lot of people want to sit around and chat. And we definitely do. And that's where a lot of those relationships start is just friendship more than anything. Uh, I mean, it, a lot of those cases don't start with people being a customer. Uh, you know, a, a font shop really doesn't have any uh, super business buying paper other than advertising. Um, so it's really you know, a lot of those relationships are kind of goofy, strange things that just come out of nowhere. Um, so, but we, we love them. I mean, it, with the house guys, I wouldn't know where we'd be without having the, all that awesome stuff to see. And, and I mean, it's, it's stuff like that's so cool. All right. So Mike, again, has a question, which I love Mike Jones. <laughs> it's always nice to hear the questions. Any chance you develop a line of translucents? And then talk about how you decide and how often you're looking at the um, industry or what the need is to to decide on new lines or new paper? Um, so right now, we're really heavy as far as uh, stocking grades go. We have nine, uh, ten stocking grades now, um, and that's a ton for French paper. Uh, Explain the, that to somebody who doesn't know what stocking grades mean. So we have, 
Oh, uh, we have swatch books, and each each of those is a grade for itself. So it's a, a a line of colors that all go together, and that are all uh, kind of in the same family. So we, like I said, we have we have ten of those right now. Each one each one is between five and twenty five colors inside each one. So we we have a lot of stuff, and you got to remember each one of those is a ton of stuff in the warehouse, whether it's envelopes, sheets. Uh, different basis weights, different sizes, all that stuff. So, um, we're we're out of space right now. So, we're we're not really looking to expand today. Um, if something was really glaring and said we said you know hey uh, uh, somebody got rid of all of their uh, browns. We would say you know we probably need to add some browns so that people can have some brown options. Um, but that's that's where a lot of that stuff comes from. Uh, as far as translucents go, I can guarantee Mike that we're not going to do that, and the only reason is because we can't make translucents. <laughs> if we could, there there'd be a really good chance of it, but we uh, our machine won't do it, so that's that's a no no. So it's just a technology. You just don't have the equipment. Yeah, yeah. Translucents. The the type of machine is a totally totally different animal from ours. Um, that's like asking you if you're gonna fly somewhere in your car. It's just there's no <laughs> chance that it's gonna happen. All right. So a couple. Uh, one, two last questions. What or what is next for French paper? And where do you do you see it, do you and your dad and your grandpa see it going in the same place? I guess. Uh, I, it's it's really hard to say where's the future because we we don't make a lot of those decisions. Uh, it's it's the the designers, the the industry, uh, the big customers that really push that stuff. Um, so short term, it's really tough. I would say the the number one thing we push for is uh, availability. Uh, our 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 goal, our huge push, is to get paper in the hands of designers and give them the capability to make their cool project. Um, from there, we could, we have to trust them to, to make it happen. Um, as far as long term goes, I would say my dad probably thinks it's bleak with my sister and I. Uh, but uh, it's uh, once again, I mean, I, I don't see uh, going back to the growing, the expanding thing. I don't see us expanding. Uh, I mean, we're like I said, it's it's not it's not even something that we even think about uh, buying other machines or mills. Um, but I also don't see us going anywhere. Uh, I mean, it, Niles is home for me, and there's no reason I'd ever leave here. And, uh, I mean, paper is, like I said at the very beginning, it's so much fun. Uh, I mean, who would have known that a, a young idiot would be on a show talking to designers all over the country? I mean, this is, this is the coolest thing. You can't beat my job, so I'm not going anywhere. So I want to look at a couple pictures um, that you sent, and you just kind of walk us through who they are and what it is. I think I know who these people are, but you tell us. Uh, so that is actually my dad and I. Uh, that's in our beater room, so that's where our process starts uh, at the very beginning. Uh, that was actually taken. We had a, a film crew come through and do a, a short film about American-made companies and, and uh, manufacturing that still happens here, and that was a shot from that. Cool. Does anybody ever expect you to speak French? Uh, no. Uh, we do still have a lot of people that think we're in France, though. <laughs> what's, sure. what's the lead time on that paper? Oh, that's quick. <laughs> right. uh, so that is just a shot from across the river. Uh, the building on the right is our uh, powerhouse. So that's where our hydro generators are. Uh, they're lined up across the wall, four wide. And then to the left, out of shot, is where the dam is. So that's why the water is all turbulent there. Gotcha. That is Bruce and Charles Anderson. Bruce on the left, Charles Anderson on the right. So this is the very beginning of the, the relationship. Uh, I believe Chuck was still at Duffy when that picture was taken, so very, very young. Um, Bruce is the only non-French person to ever be the president of French paper, so he's uh, pretty near and dear to our heart. I say non-French, but he's about as French as it gets. He's a, he's a family member. <laughs> Uh, that is one of our newest promos, um, and I put that one in here. We, we were talking about the, the very simple stuff. So that's Lemon Drop Pop Tone with one color on it. Well, and I think it's always, um, I know Inch by Inch uses um, Lemon Drop. Yep. And Mama Sauce prints it, and it's just with black, but, again, it's on letterpress. So doing doing things with one color on a different kind of press can really make a difference. But I think you guys have always... Um, the design has always been really, really strong, and then using a limited 
color palette. It's that you don't have to have all the bells and whistles because your design is so strong. Yep, and then this this was actually that that one was a, uh, a promotion we took actually to the How Conference, and it was to hold all of our other promos. So it was kind of a portfolio package, and uh, those things were you know so bright and crazy, and it was uh, kind of a billboard for French paper for everywhere people walked around. So not only did you get cool stuff, but you walked around promoting French paper whether you knew it or not. <laughs> Well, I think that's another thing. It's like even the way the paper's wrapped. Um, I always am always impressed. Um, I know you can't see it, but it's behind me. See, I expect it to start rain. I've had that one. That's what I do my my stuff on. But I love that. And again, it's just one color, right? Um, one. It's just black on a craft, and I think it's it's really nice, and it gives. I think it gives the designers the ability to see something great happening in a limited budget. And then this uh, is the website, right? Yep, that's our homepage there. So that's where, like you said, this is where we're, we offer all the small sizes, uh, the the free images through CSA up on the top, which is awesome. And then also, uh, if you go to our blog, that's another cool one. We've really been pushing. Anything people print on French paper, we really want to show it off. So if anybody out there that's listening has projects, go on there. You can submit it yourself, uh, and we would love to show off your stuff. So please let us see it. All right, and I just posted the the blog. So uh, Abby wants to know who designed your logo. Uh, Charles Anderson and his guys. Uh, they do everything for us. So if you see it and it looks like it's been drawn, it was them. Uh, I promise you it didn't happen here. <laughs> <laughs> and then we talked about the craft tone, and that came out when? What was uh, it in the summer? That was uh, no, actually the beginning of summer. It would have been May. We kicked it off because we kicked it off okay. at the How Conference. Uh, so that's that's our newest grade there. Yep. And uh, then that is the the fearsome trio. Uh, so that's uh, Nick Sombrato on the far right, and then Bob Ewing in the center. Uh, I think you've had Bob on the show, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple times. Oh, so yep. that was that was at Creative South. Uh, uh, Mike Jones had us down and had us uh, do a little talking, and that was a fun picture we took. Nick is, doesn't look like he's quite um, uh, he's connecting. Looking. You and Bob kind of like got the cool face going, but you'll have to work on Nick with his cool. <laughs> we got a lot to work on with Nick. <laughs> But it's it was I really enjoyed the print matters and one of the things I mean I've talked to Bob a lot and so um, I always hearing what Bob has to say and I really liked hearing what Nick had to say just about printing and the and the power of printing and, and just doing things the right way but I really I because I've been such a huge fan of French paper I really liked I think I raised my hand like three times and I, I think you got most of the um, answer questions to the audience they were like uh, can we talk to Brian please so it was it was really fun to me to hear some of those answers and it was really nice that you and Kim both were really easy to talk to and um, just really approachable that you were at the, ta the your table in the um, vendor village or whatever yep. and I think that was that was really nice so any any closing words, and I'm going to share all your links in just a second. But Brian, I just want to tell you, thank you so much. I, you know, when you like geek out over certain things, like I love French paper, and so I'm excited that um, I know a lot of other people love French paper too. And so the blogs are a really neat way for people to go and share what they've done with French paper. So that's that's super cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and not on top of that, just just seeing what other people are doing too. You know, that get the creative juices flowing. So, yeah, I mean, uh, thank you so much for having me. I seriously, I really appreciate this. Uh, thank you everybody for coming and participating and asking questions too. And Mike, right? You want to yeah. thank Mike specifically? Yes, thank you, Mike. <laughs> uh, not only for that, but being awesome too. <laughs> right. And, and Jason Craig, just for taking us off topic, because it's always good to get off topic, right? Because we can't work all this whole time. We need to be like your grandpa says, only 50%, right? Yeah, yeah you got to have a curveball here and there. So I think it's funny that um, I think probably you do, your dad's probably not doing much of your social media, but um, you guys have one for French. French paper like the company company and then you have yours so I'm gonna share yours so the your uh, Twitter and Instagram where well, your Twitter is Frenchified and it's over there on the right and then your Instagram is at Frenchy underscore fry and then the company which I bet you handle also possibly I do, yeah. <laughs> is at French paper co yep. so um, 
I think it's hard sometimes to manage all those different things. So I'm I'm really glad that you take the time to do it because I think it's a great way for a small company to be able to reach a big audience. So uh, we, we like the interaction. So it's it's uh, that's my favorite part of it. I mean, just talking to people and seeing stuff is is so cool. So it's it's a pleasure for us. Well, good. Well, and if you guys have questions, um, you can always contact me at. Diane at designrecharge.org. And next week, it's a step into European design history. My friend Brooke, who's been on the show before talking about green design, and um, she's also a professor. She took a bunch of students over to Europe and did all these tours of all this really cool stuff. And I kept seeing all these Facebook and Instagram posts, and I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to have you on to just give us this photo tour of what you learned and what you saw um, when you were doing the European design tour. So hopefully you guys will um, join in next week for that. And um, she's awesome. She has a lot of energy, so I'm always excited to have her back on. Um, so come next week, same time. If you have any questions, you can always email me again at diane at designrecharge.org, or you can just Twitter, whatever. I don't ever say that right. You can connect with me on Twitter or Instagram at Design Recharge. So thank you guys, and I'll see you next week. And Brian, thank you so much, and go French paper. Thank you very much. See you guys.